In this video, we want to learn about case 2 when we have more than one sample. Let's say we have two samples and we don't know the variance from the populations. So in that case, what are we going to do is that we would use the t-test, the same um, situation like that we had for the uh, time that we are in the case 2 and we had one sample. You can look at the video of it. We, have it, we already have it uploaded. So what's going to happen? We want to talk about the um, hypothesis test first, and then we would go to the confidence interval. For the hypothesis test, uh, so we are the parameter of interest. Step number one was that give me the parameter of interest. The parameter of interest is mu. It's difference between the mu, mu one and mu two that we have. The difference between them. Uh, in some books, they are going to write it down as um, like mu one minus mu two as delta no. Or in some books, you can see that they would write it delta d like capital D, um, it's the same. It doesn't matter. As long as we know that what are we looking for, it's fine. Like we know the concept behind it, it's fine. So we are, the parameter of interest is difference between the mu. Then we have the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis that mu1 minus mu2 is equal to the delta no or delta D. And the alternative hypothesis that's when they are, their difference is not equal to the, that ex, um, expected value, that value that we are we're hoping that we would have as a difference between that like delta no. So that was one, uh, we had three steps. Step number four was that give me your test statistics. So we are in case two here. I can write down here like, mm, like red marker. So case two. So for the case two, the test statistic, we are looking with the t-test, exactly the same um the table that we had for one sample the only difference is that over there when we had one sample we said that um i can write it down as a side note again so um so over there we said that when we have one sample we are on case two and one sample or one population, we would say t or t null, it was x bar minus mu divided by, for a standard error of it, uh, we said we, can, we, we are going to put um, s as the estimated value, right, or sigma estimate, so it would be s over the square root of n. So this one, again, I can write it down x bar minus mu divided by, instead of this, I can write down sigma, not sigma, sigma estimate, can be sigma estimate, right? Sigma estimate is the same as s or s power 2. So sigma estimate power 2 or s power 2 divided by the n. It's the same. So when we have two samples and we don't know the variance of the, we don't know, we don't know the variance of the population. So we don't know the sigma. So we would use the t-test. So for t-test, here it's written. It's going to be like x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus, like this one is the um, difference between them. Like whatever is mu 1 minus mu 2, right? So I'm going to write down delta no. And then for the standard error, I would put, put down like s pooled. Like because we have two, think about it. I have two samples that these two samples they have two different variants. We don't know the variance, but we know that they can be different. So this is the general equation of it. If two variants of these two samples, they were the same, that's fine. So you're just going to, in this equation, S1 and S2, they're going to be the same. So we would use the same equation. You, we, we would name it like SD. Don't worry about that one. There are many equations that we have. But the concept behind it is like this. I have like my SP, like S pooled. You are going to pull your um, pull your variances, power two, right? And then this is one number, sp, and it's equal to this. And then times like one over n one plus one over n two, like the same things that we had here. It's s two times one over n, right? So we would have sp here. We are going to pull the variance, and then like n one and n two. What's happening here is that sp power two. Then we are looking for these. Um, variance like pooled variance so what we would say is like n1 minus 1 times s1 power 2 plus n2 minus 1 times s2 power 2 
divided by n1 plus n2 minus 2. So this n1 plus n2 minus 2 is equal to the degree of freedom as well. When we were working with the t test, um, let's recall it quickly. When we had one sample for the confidence interval, we would say that, okay, so our confidence interval is like x bar plus minus margin of error. The margin of error, it was t at half of the alpha, comma, degree of freedom. So when we are working with the t test, degree of freedom matters a lot. So here, we, it's how we can find out the degree of freedom. For example, let's say I have two samples. One of them, they have like 14 data points. The other one has 16 data points. So when I'm talking about the degree of freedom, my degree of freedom is going to be 14 plus 16, I said. Okay, 14 plus 16 minus 2. So that would be, you have two S, right? So it's like that you're removing two degree of freedom from it, like two um, freedom. So your degree of freedom is going to be the total end that you have minus 2. You can think about it that way as well. So here I have my um, test statistic. So when I find out the test statistic, what do you the next one? Let's say um, quickly. It would be um, for the test statistic. So I found the, let's say from the beginning, parameter of interest mu, step number two, the null hypothesis, step number three, alternative hypothesis, step number four, test statistic, step number five, alpha, what's our alpha? Like 95% confidence interval, alpha is going to be 5% or something else. Depends on the confidence interval, like the percentage of the confidence interval. Alpha is step number five. Step number six is the rejection region. So for the rejection region, we would find out the T of the observed and we will compare it with the T of the alpha. So if my T of the observed is less than the T of the alpha, T at alpha and the degree of freedom, then I would say I'm the rejection region. Or if it's greater than that, it depends that if you are in the lower bound or the upper bound. So we would say we are in the, um, it's like this. Just quickly. Let's say here I have the T uh, at half of the alpha. And let's say it's the two sided. Uh, half of the alpha and the degree of freedom. And here is T and half of the alpha and degree of freedom. So DF is the DOF, degree of freedom. In some books, they show it by nu, but some books, they show it by K. Um, we will call it degree of freedom. Um, it doesn't matter what symbol we are using. right? So here is going to be minus T of the half alpha. So this area and this area, these are rejection. Reject. The same here. So this one is the rejection region as well. Just because that. Okay, so we have the rejection region for the step number six. Step number seven is calculation, so I'm going to put everything like all the numbers here, and step number ten, uh, eight is that give me the conclusion. So for the conclusion, we will compare the T null. If T null was here, I would say that we are in the rejection criteria so region, so we would say we reject the null hypothesis. If it wasn't here, it was here, like T null was greater than the T of the, um, from the table, what would we say? We say that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And null hypothesis is this area. Null hypothesis is that, okay, so whatever x bar 1 minus x bar 2 that you found, it's going to be like, there is no error. There is no, we had the type 1 error here, right? So this is the same as the type 1 error. So it's like that we are here. So it's like that there is no uh, mistake in it. We are not in the rejection um, area. So let's see. This is, this was my um, hypothesis test. Eight steps. The next step, like the next thing that we want to do together is that we want to construct the confidence interval. So for the constructing the confidence interval, Let's see I construct confidence interval. So for the confidence interval, um, what would we do is like again it's very similar to the uh, when we have one sample. So we would say instead of writing down mu is between two um, bounds or like lower bound and upper bound, we would say mu one minus mu two is between two numbers. And because it's the continuous situation we are talking about, so it doesn't matter if we put the equality sign or not. 
just one tiny point, so it doesn't matter. So mu1 minus mu2 for the lower band and upper band. So I would say here it's going to be x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus my margin of error. And here is going to be x bar 1 minus x bar 2 plus my margin of error. So in a sort of margin of error here, I would put down like t at half of the alpha, the degree of freedom, and t at half of the alpha, the degree of freedom, and then I'm going to put down my standard error. The standard error is whatever you have in the denominator here. So it's going to be the standard error. So this is the mother equation for it. It's the, it doesn't matter if my like the S1 and S2 they are the same or not. So when you go through the notes or you would go through the box, they said that, okay, so let's have true cases. So we would have the, um, we have like the situation that two different, like two different cases that we have like the our S, they are the same and our S, they are not the same, like the um, variance or standard deviation of the two samples that we have. So what are we going to but it doesn't matter as long as you use this equation. Like, for example, they say that let's say if n, they are the same. Listen to this part. If n of two samples, like n1 and n2, they are the same. And we have same s for them. Like, or we have the situation of the pair t test. In that case, what are we going to do? Instead of this s e, we would use down, we, we would use like s d. Like s d times, um, 1 over a square root of n. So don't worry about this part. So just know that this is the general equation. Whatever you put in it, it's going to give you the answer. So you can you can use with that equation as well. So that equation is like this. We would say t at the half of the alpha and the degree of freedom. And because our n's, they are the same, n1 and n2, they are the same, it's equal some n. So the degree of freedom is going to be n minus 1. It won't be. It's like that you have n1 plus Again, n1, because n1 and n2, they're the same, right? n1 plus n1 minus 2. So it's like that you would say 2n minus 2. So you can say that it's equal, it's similar to the n minus 1. But all of these things is like that. We just, we have this um, mother equation and we just try to make like branch for it. But it's going to, it's like the time that is going to be consumed to find out the answer from this is very quick. So in my experience, it's good that if you just say that, okay, so it doesn't matter. Have it like this. If the n1 and n2, they're the same, you can go with the equation that instead of t times se, which is se is here. So instead of this, you would say it's like t and then times sd, so a standard deviation, and then times 1 over a square root of n. It's going to give you the same answer. So it's better that that's my suggestion or recommendation that we would stick with this equation that as a general equation and you, we would use it. However, that those equations that you would see on the notes like or on other books are the same. The only thing is that those are not the general form. This is a general form. And you work with this one a lot in the lab. So think about it. You have two samples. You get the two samples. And then you calculate the S, like S1 and S2 from your sample. It's not the same. So what are you going to do? And you don't know the variance of the population. And you want to compare the difference between these two samples. So in that case, you would go with the pair t test or this test. So you would assume that those s are the same. Or you consider them as S1 and S2. I would suggest that you would go with this one. It's, it's worth it, it's whatever time that you put on it. OK, so this is for the confidence interval on it. And then we can have the lower bound and the upper bound as well. If you are interested in the lower bound, just consider this. Instead of half of the alpha, you would put alpha. If you are interested in the upper bound, then consider this, like remove this and consider this part. And instead of half of the alpha, again, you are going to put the alpha for it. So that's for the time that we are interested yeah, on the difference between mu1 and mu2. Um, and we don't know the variance of the, like we don't know sigma1 and sigma2, what are them? Or the variance of standard deviation, they are very related, right? We don't know them.